Ain't no use it in one way, babe, if you don't know right now. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Taste Like Music. I am Joe Staggerwald. This is my lovely co-host, Dylan Seavey. This is Discovering Dylan. I'm discovering Bob Dylan, not Dylan Seavey. This is episode three of the wildly popular podcast, where basically, you know, I'm going I'm to run through it much quicker than Bob Dylan would go through a song. We're going through Dylan's discography, every album. We're trying to make me love Bob Dylan. It's a character flaw that I admit readily. And this little project, little podcast, hoping to spur, um, you know, that love for Bob Dylan and everything that he does. And so far, it's actually going pretty well. Last episode, we did Bob Dylan 1962, the debut, which I had never, I don't think, ever heard mentioned by anyone Ever other than to skip it over and to kind of shoo it and overlook it. And I was mildly blown away by what I heard, uh, a side of Bob Dylan that I had not heard before, that punkier, bluesier, kind of, you know, raucous, just something I wasn't sure that he was capable of. And, you know, I liked the album a good bit, to quote Ryan Kramzer. Uh, I gave it four stars unofficial rating don't quote me on that but it is something i think i would come back to and uh, i liked it and i it didn't do the things that i associate negatively with bob dylan so that was a good start kind of got my juices flowing for more bob dylan today we'll be discussing the freewheeling bob dylan uh, dylan's second album and the one that launched his you know star into orbit uh, the one that made him the, the voice of a generation, et cetera, et cetera. You know, all the law that you can toss at him. Dylan, how are you? And uh, I know you were excited when I fell somewhat for, for Bob Dylan, 1962. And and this one, you know, I think you know my thoughts on it a little bit. We uh, went over it in the 63 deep dive on this channel. So this one, I don't think there's going to be too much surprise with how I feel about it. How do you feel about Free Will and Bob Dylan in the, the scope of Dylan and how it relates to you know him and, and everything that comes afterwards and what it made him? Yeah, I, I love Free Will and I think Free Will in, in some ways is almost, I feel like with any artist, it's easy to take for granted their most, like you said, lauded work. Um and I feel like with Dylan, people generally think back, I think, to the mid-60s electric trilogy when they they think of his most important work or his most critically acclaimed work. But Free Willin is up there too. And, and I almost feel like in some ways it's even easier to take for granted because as much as I love it and as much as a lot of other people love it, I feel like there's this weird sort of expect you know people know that he went electric so this whole period of him doing these acoustic albums was almost like i think for some people this um you know just like a preface to almost like the the real part of his career or the beginning of the rest of his career you know we're gonna end up talking about 40 records you know and it's his by his fifth album, he's already going electric. And, you know, in the same way that it might be easy for someone to take for granted a song like like a Rolling Stone or, you know, any of the big ones across those, that trilogy of records. Uh, you know, it's the same thing with Blown in the Wind, Hard Rains Are Gonna Fall, Don't Think Twice It's All Right, Girl from the North Country, Masters of War. But to take a step back and to realize that one guy wrote Blowing in the wind, a hard rain's are gonna fall. Don't think twice, it's all right. Masters of War and Girl from the North Country between the ages of 20 and 21 years old is incomprehensible, especially when preceding it is a very enjoyable record that features two original songs, which, while good in their own ways, are not on the level of these. Like, you, some songwriters go their entire life hoping to write one song as good as any of those five songs I just named off. Bob did it before most kids his age had college degrees. 
I think going back and, and listening to them is just unreal. I mean, Hard Rains are going to follow Masters of War, you know, very distinctly different commentaries on the political and societal changes happening around him. Blown in the Wind, I think, I mean, for anyone who has spent so much time trying to answer all of these insane life questions that they may have about either their own lives or the life around them. You know, and in this case, how many roads must a man walk down before you can call him a man? How many seas must a white dove sail before it sleeps in the sand? To have the wisdom to know that that answer may never come to you, or if it comes to you, it will come to you when it will, that that is not in your control. I've spent my entire adult life struggling to come to terms with the fact that most things are not in my control, that most things are just blowing in the wind, you know, and this, this, this guy was making it an anthem before he could legally drink, or I guess at the time, maybe he could, but semantics don't think twice. It's all right. I mean, we'll eventually get to blood on the tracks, but you know, the, the brilliance of, of blood on the tracks, I think is his ability to go through kind of every emotion that comes with the disillusion of a long-term relationship, you know, be that heartbreak, anger, depression. And he kind of does it all within this one song too. Like, don't think twice. It's all, it's a very bitter send off, you know, one, one of the greatest fuck you lines ever written, you know, I ain't saying you treated me unkind. You could have done better, but I don't mind. You just kind of wasted my precious time, but don't think twice. It's all right. But it's coming from such a deep place of hurt and insecurity in his own right. And then, you know, Wistful Longing, Girl from the North Country, you know, based off of the uh, the traditional Scarborough Fair song, which obviously we heard a few years later with Simon and Garfunkel too. Um, I, I mean, I just think it's it's unbelievable. I do know what you generally think of it, but I'm interested to see how you feel now. You know, you you were saying that you were not worried that you weren't going to enjoy this album because you already knew that you enjoyed it, but worried that now you you'd heard this this energy, this raucousness from him, and is that all just going to disappear now? Am I going to be let down? And I was hoping that you would hear that restlessness and that desire of his in other ways, if it wasn't necessarily him strumming the guitar super hard and, you know, doing all the big folk whoops and, and yodels and yowls and everything like that. So how do you feel listening to it after the context of the first record? Well, I still like it. I'll, I'm, I'm not lowering the score or anything. It's still my ninth favorite, maybe, maybe moved up even to eighth favorite album of 1963. But I do miss that Bob Dylan a little bit. And as much as I respect the songwriting and the growth, I mean, Blown in the Wind is such an important song. Even if I hated every second of it, like you can't not talk about its power and the effect it had on songwriting for everyone. I mean, Sam Cooke read a really great little quote. Peter Gurlnick uh, writes in 2005's Dream Boogie, The Triumph of Sam Cooke, when Sam Cooke heard a change is going to come, he was so carried away with the message and the fact that a white boy had written it that he was almost ashamed not to have written something like that himself. So, I mean, here's 21-year-old honky you know, Bob Dylan coming along and just totally blowing the, the roof and the lid off of what songwriting can be. And I'm always going to respect Bob Dylan for that because he a complete sea change personal it can be long-winded it can be you know ev everything like there was no limits anymore to songwriting song lengths you know just for pop rock folk this was the change you know a change was going to come and it was bob dylan and he changed everything uh so i always respect him for that he also and this is maybe his most important thing other than the, the whole blown in the wind societal change uh, making that palatable to a pop audience is his songwriting became much vaguer during, you know, between 62 and 63. You know, he moved from the particular to the general 
And uh, another quote I found from Andy Gill, he said, Dylan discovered the effectiveness of moving from the particular to the general, whereas the bout of Donald White would become completely redundant as soon as the eponymous criminal is executed. A song as vague as Blown in the Wind could be applied to just about any freedom issue. Maybe, you know, he always had it in him, but when he started writing in this manner, you know, this is why there's 8,000 Wikipedia pages and critical essays on all of his lyrics. And why Joan Baez famously wrote, uh, you who are so good with words and at keeping things vague from Diamonds and Rust about Bob Dylan. It's this vagueness and this ability, you know, people hear these songs a million different ways. But I think that's so important to his legend and his ability as a songwriter is to touch all these people in different ways. Some, you know, completely different, you know, the way people hear it. That all being said, all the the great things about Bob Dylan's songwriting. The thing that holds it back for me is always going to be the melodies. And what I hear is sort of a lack of energy still. And there's the energy that I found on Bob Dylan 62. And it's not completely gone. It's not, you know, I think in the past I would have said uh, this, this album is boring. Like he doesn't sing with any passion. He does. Like he still has some, some cool vocal ticks. I think his, vocals on girl from the north country are fantastic i mean they're really good i was really listening close and i was kind of impressed by how how well he conveys the emotions of the song just in like little pitch changes like just real subtle stuff that he's doing and same with with the big songs you know blown in the wind girl from the north country mashes of war uh, a hard rain's gonna fall don't think twice it's all right all those songs are masterpieces as far as I'm concerned. Like, they're all great. It's some of the others. Like Bob Dylan's Blues, uh, Bob Dylan's Dream, Oxford Town, Talking World War III Blues. When he goes into, like, white boy blues mode and he slows it down and he gets kind of, like, I don't know, it's like he's trying too hard to be, like, this honky sort of redneck and he's kind of doing, like, these vocal uh, ticks and stuff that, I don't know. It just doesn't work for me. I find it a little annoying. I find some of the song lengths too long, kind of just starts repeating himself too much. And it's sort of like the things that I know I don't like about Bob Dylan sort of coming to light here. Like on Bob Dylan's blues, like he's doing those like horse cries and it's almost like a faux buffoonery, like old Western style singing. And it, to me, it just doesn't fit next to something like A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. And, you know, the, the guitar work kind of in the background for most of the album, like there's some nice little arpeggios and chords and stuff here and there. But I don't think anything I really noticed, unlike the 62 album, where I was like, OK, that's pretty cool. Like that's, you know, a, a cool different way of playing guitar that I had heard before. Now he's just kind of fallen back into the standard folkyisms, And it's not, it's just not quite as interesting. The harmonica is not quite as raucous and rambunctious. Uh, I do like Karina Karina, the addition of the bass and drums on there. I, I love the final line. I got to talk about the final line uh, of I Shall Be Free, where he says, make love to Elizabeth Taylor, catch hell from Richard Burton. Now, that is a beautiful way to end an album. Like that's some like, 2010 like rapper beef kind of thing that you'd throw out there uh so that's great I, I do like this album i think he's an amazing writer he was leagues miles ahead of anyone else you know maybe except for like i don't know sondheim and Jacques Brel or something like people like that you know they had a way with words maybe that could rival dylan but as far as like channeling it into you know societal change and um, you know, the venom and masters of war. He got some brilliant stuff. I just wish I liked the music as much as I enjoyed the, the songwriting and even the singing. I think the singing is fine. It's really just the songwriting that kind of drags on me. Uh, it is 49 minutes long or something like that. It's, it's a super long album for 1963. Chop 24 three minutes off of here and maybe you got a five-star album but i i want like i i love the lyrics so much that i really wish i liked it even more than i do and i'm trying god knows i'm trying but that's probably just where i'm going to end up with an album like this i respect it at a five-star level 
but I enjoy listening to it on merely a four star level. Yeah, I don't think it's a perfect album. Um, and I agree. Bob Dylan's blues is is the quote unquote low point for me too. There, there's nothing on this album that I dislike. And in fact, it it takes multiple albums for there. I mean, the worst Bob Dylan material, in my opinion, is as hard to listen to as as any other artist. Um, I mean, for me, I think there's a level of intrigue because I love him so much that maybe I'm a little more apt to, to revisit his worst material. But there is stuff I thoroughly dislike in this catalog, but it's going to take quite a few albums before we get there. I think the worst offenders on this record are more so forgettable. I think a song like Bob Dylan's blues is pretty forgettable. Um, and I understand what you're saying. I, I think Bob Dylan is a much better melodist than people give him credit for. I'm not going to say that his melodies are, you know, on the level of a, a Paul McCartney or a Brian Wilson or anything like that. You know, something like Don't Think Twice, It's All Right. You know, it ain't no use sitting on the way, babe, if you don't know by now. It's like, I I don't think people realize until they sing them, it's the same thing. And and again, you've said multiple times your problem isn't with his voice. So this isn't directed at you. But I feel like when people say that he's a bad singer, they don't like the sound of his voice, which is fine. But there's a difference between someone not being a good singer, not liking the sound of someone's voice. And and even Girl from the North Country, you know, a lot of that melody, you know, some of it is is nicked from the traditional song. Some of it he puts his own spin on. But same thing, you travel in the North Country, find when to hell you on the borderline, the only to want to lose that. Like, he, he travels a long way. I think that he he really hits on those melodies very nice. Um but yeah, I mean, from a musical perspective, there's not as much of that in your face sort of, you know, uh, hard hard strumming and, and hard picking and everything. The, the guitar work on Don't Think Twice It's All Right, I do think is is pretty marvelous. But, you know, to me, where I hear that energy of the first album come in on this album is in two separate ways. There's the first way is like in a song like Masters of War, listening to that very subtle, seething delivery of something like, and I hope that you die and your death will come soon. Follow your path to the gray afternoon. I'll stand while you're loaded to your deathbed. I'll stand over your grave till I'm sure that you're dead. You know, like, and listen to him. See, like, whereas on the first album, He's letting out all these emotions and he, these songs that he's heard so many times and he's studied. This is something he's written and he has even more of an understanding of trying to get across this unbearable anger, but feeling like you have to keep it together for the sake of whatever it is, the people around you, society in general, yourself, not, not wanting to let yourself, you know, get too ahead of yourself, but you hear it. And the other way in which I hear it is just his sheer humor. I mean, Bob is such a funny friggin' guy, and you hear it so much in his songwriting. And there's so many other stories that I'm sure we'll tell it at some point over the course of this show. But a song like Talking World War Three Blues, which you know has so much going on, you know, mo mostly a lot of uh, you know sentiments on you know, the the, the anti-communist, uh, the anti-red movement, whatnot, but just some of these lines that he throws in there, uh, you know, what's this one verse? I was feeling kind of lonesome and blue. I needed somebody to talk to, so I called up the operator of time just to hear a voice of some kind. When you hear the beep, it'll be three o'clock. She said that for over an hour, and I hung up. Like, that. <laughs> that's such an insane non sequitur to throw out there. And then, and then of course, the, the end, half the people can be part right all the time. Some of the people can be all right part of the time, but all of the people can't be all right all the time. I think Abraham Lincoln said that. I'll let you be in my dreams if I can be in yours. I said that. Like, he, he is just inhabiting, I, I, I think, some of what you're talking about, I think some of your criticisms, which I think are legit to certainly to a point, are that 
I, I think there are times where he is trying so hard to inhabit this sort of folky caricature that it doesn't come across as totally genuine. Or even if it's not totally disingenuous at a certain point, it's just like, okay, yeah, you know, we, we get it, Bob, you know, like you, you could trim some of these songs off. Like you already accomplished this in this other song. Um, but I think when he's successful in that sort of thing, that sort of troubadour, relatable, funny storytelling. Yeah. It's, it's as good as any, anything that anyone else had done up to that point. And in most cases it's better. So that's how I feel. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally get what you're saying and, I mean, some of the, the lyrics are brilliant. Uh, Masters of War in particular. I think even Jesus would never forgive what you do is one of just like the most biting, like caustic line, like just totally vicious. Like, I don't I don't know if anyone had said anything like that badass ever on record. Well, I'm sure someone has. Uh, I'll go back and listen to every song uh, written and recorded before 1963. But to to break out lines like that in Masters of War, like that, I mean, that's that's some good shit from Bob on on that. To counter briefly, just real quick, the melody thing. My two favorite songs are sort of nicked. You know, the melodies. Don't think twice. It's all right. Was based on a melody in the public domain. Who's gonna buy your chickens when I'm gone? I haven't heard that song, so I don't know how closely it skews to it. Um, and then of course, go from the North Country is. I mean, it's a little bit borrowed from from Scarborough Fair. It's not like direct yeah. copy, but I mean, I do think those are his two best melody lines on the album. And you know, he he borrowed, and uh, you know, he's still in his borrowing yeah. phase. A couple lines uh, from other folk writers and singers and public domain melodies, but yes, he's fashioning it into his own, you know, take on the thing. He's not just like blatantly ripping stuff off. So. Maybe my my wall still hasn't totally come down on, on Bob Dylan. And I, I think, you know, I always sort of play up my own dislike of Bob Dylan because it gets a, a good reaction from people. And because, you know, I, you know, I think he's, you know, a four star album guy for you know, a long time and tons of albums. I think, you know, good, very good four star albums. But compared to how everyone else feels about him, it, it still feels like I hate him. So maybe the, this whole this, <laughs> this whole podcast is just a sham. But I'm I'm sure I'll get into some crazier opinions coming up. Maybe when he goes electric. So we'll we'll see. Well, I think that we'll consider this series a great success if by the end of it your opinions are kind of skewing towards the yeah you know I I like this guy. You know, I, I don't, I, I'm not and I don't think anyone is expecting you to become a huge super fan, but I know a lot of super fans who kind of have the opinion of, yeah, you know, I really like the acoustic records and I respect them and I enjoy them. But, you know, my great appreciation for Bob really starts when he goes electric. So ultimately, you know, I I don't think there's anything wrong if whether it's right now or looking back on it, you end up saying, hey, yeah, you know, the early stuff, there's a lot of it that I do like and I and I respect or I appreciate all of it, but it's just not all my thing. I mean, J Jason has gone on record as saying that that Bob is one of his favorite artists, you know, top five artists for him. And and I, I think his favorite deck, well, his favorite decade is the 70s for everybody, but but for, for Bob as well, you know, so if, if someone who knows and appreciates so much music and, and holds Dylan in that high regard, and Jason is also on record as saying that he likes these early acoustic albums too, but they're not his favorites either. So I don't think you need to be fretting just yet. I don't think you need to be panicking just yet. I am very, very interested going now into album number three, the times they are a change in because uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this is one maybe that you haven't heard in its entirety. Correct. Right. If I've heard this in its entirety, I was not paying attention. Uh, so <laughs> I've, I've seen the track list and I know a couple songs, but this this could be you know, an interesting period. These next two, uh, from what I've read, 
um dylan was sort of being too much of a rock star maybe and sort of not i, I don't know i i read some things that didn't make them sound like they were masterpieces on the same level and maybe these next two are sort of forgotten about a little bit after the title track maybe people are trying to get in the electric stuff already i don't know we'll we'll see i i gotta listen to it i gotta read some stuff on it but it's another one where i don't hear it talked about nearly as much outside of the the title track so you said a lot there that i want to respond to but i'm gonna hold back because we gotta we gotta focus on one album at a time here I I don't think that the times they are a change in is well it's certainly not an insignificant record on any level I don't think um and I I don't think you know I I think that freewheeling tends to get a lot of hype or or just talked about more often because it has those five songs that are extremely well known um, whereas the title track for Times is maybe really the only one that's been kind of resonant with, with, you know, more uh, casual listeners and whatnot. But uh, from a historical standpoint, from a standpoint of, of Bob's timeline as a whole, it's it's a very significant album. I'm going to try my best to not give away too much what I think about uh, every individual album until... You know, you, you've also listened to it, but what I'm very, in, I, I don't want to say that I'm terrified because I don't think that you're going to hate this record, but this is a record where I think for the first time, I think freewheeling is kind of almost like this incredible statement of intent of like, I'm going to show you what I can do, all the ways in which I can do it. And how fucking good I am at all those things. And like, what the fuck are you going to do about it? Like, bam, like, here you go. Times, I think, and I don't think it's necessarily like, it's not a mess or anything like that. But Times is a very, very focused record where he's going into this very much. And and we're going to see this a lot through his career where he goes into a project you know, sometimes it's it's something as obvious as, okay, I'm going to go into this Sinatra covers project, you know, to prove that, you know, I can do something with these songs. But there's a lot of albums where he goes into something like, this is who I'm going to be for this record, you know, which I, I think for a lot of Dylan detractors, they use that to be like, oh, well, this this guy is, he's never been genuine and he's always putting on an act. And to me, I, I don't think of, really too much of it is disingenuous i mean i i I think that he's a very complex person and whoever whatever he says is what he's feeling or thinking in that moment and with times he's going into this very much i think with the intent of like okay you know i've i've hit a lot on some of these societal issues these these big grander thoughts you know you hear it i'm blowing in the wind hard rains are gonna fall masters of war and he really really hones in on that and you get some of those more topical songs you know you're gonna hear songs about hattie carroll and meg your evers and hollis brown names that some people remember today you know everyone certainly remembers should remember hopefully remembers the civil rights movement and how important that is and what it means and whatnot but he's going much more into that realm this is very much you know for everyone likes to talk about oh him being the protest singer the times they are a change in is kind of his only album as a protest singer like full album like that i have a lot more thoughts on it i'm gonna hold them for now I'm very, very interested to hear how you feel about it. If I'm going to say anything that I think you should keep in mind, I think you should keep in mind, as vague as this sounds, what he achieves on this record is exactly what he was trying to achieve. Take that for what you will. Okay. What it sounds like possibly what I was talking about earlier, the specificity of it maybe doesn't hold up as well 
as the vague kind of general feeling of okay, society's going to change. Now, you know, on this album, maybe now he's really talking about that. And I always go back to the show Seinfeld, which was a show about nothing. And it holds up so well because it never got into topical things ever. Like that is what was brilliant about it. It was just a show about situations and sort of vagueness. And, you know, it wasn't like some of these other sitcoms where, you know, it's always talking about, you know, things that only people in 1990 would remember. And I've been meaning to bring this up in a, in a Dylan episode because that's kind of how I, I feel about some of this stuff. That's what makes Bob Dylan so brilliant. And maybe people have a little more struggle with this one because some of those names people don't remember. Like th- those aren't like taught in history class, but those aren't the names that people you know readily associate um, with our terrible education system and everything. So I, I will keep that in my mind when listening to the album and see maybe if I agree with the notion that I just put forth. <laughs> well, what I would also, I don't know if challenge is the right word, but if you have the ability and feel up to committing to really reading along with the lyrics at some point or just listening to them really intently, you know, there there are a handful of songs on this record that on the surface directly deal with one event, one person. If in any of those songs, you can walk away definitively saying that there's nothing in that song that doesn't apply to today or doesn't have a greater universal meaning to it, then I want to talk about that. Because, you know, when you think of like, when you think of an all-time great song, let's say We Didn't Start the Fire by Billy Joel. Uh, just an all-time, you know, on every level. Um, I mean, you read the lyrics to those verses and and it's just, you know, pure poetry. But what ties it together is that unbelievable message of We Didn't Start the Fire. It was always burning since the world's been turning. Now, I hate that song. I, re- I really do. but. I I appreciate that he was attempting to make a greater point with that chorus. Do I think he was successful? I really don't. I I highly do not. But the attempt was there. I think Dylan also attempts that on this record. Spoiler alert, I'm not going to give away what I think of this record. I do think every song on this record is at least slightly better than We Didn't Start the Fire by Billy Joel. As much as I understand that critique and agree with the general concept of it, I think that that critique only applies if the songwriter doesn't write about the subject in a way that can't be related to in future generations. So you or other people listen and and listen, I know who Megger Evers and Hattie Carroll are because I know these songs. You know, and these songs have have led me to read up on those people and 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 whatnot more. But I'm not saying that you or anyone else is stupid for not knowing who. Like those people are are not talked about in the same way that Rosa Parks is, or even someone like Emmett Till. And and Bob does have a a, a song that uh, the death of Emmett Till or Ballad of Emmett Till, which um, I think only exists in demo recordings. But um, you know, there there are the names that that most people know. Um, but that being said. The songs about Hattie Carol and Megger Evers, I I will be surprised. I'm not saying you're going to love the songs. I hope you love the songs, but whether or not you do, I challenge you to find something in those songs that doesn't resonate with the world today or where we're at today. That's what well, I I don't doubt that Bob Dylan could do what you're saying. So um, I will. You don't doubt to- that oh, he definitely. could do what Billy Joel couldn't. Right. I mean, if. Billy Joel can't do it. I I don't know. I don't hold out too much faith in Bob. Just kidding. I also don't like We Didn't Start the Fire. So uh, we're at least united on that. It'll be interesting to, to see, you know, what I think about those songs. And it's one of those albums that I really have no context outside of the, you know, the title track. So I'm I'm a little more interested in that one, I think, than the Free Will and Bob Dylan, just because I already knew it. This is a chance to explore something completely different 
uh, and see how these songs, like you were saying, relate to what's going on in the world today. If they hold up, if they're greater than just sort of topical songs about civil rights, you know, and I feel like they are because it's Bob Dylan and the lyrics, I don't doubt. Now the melodies and the vocal stylings and some of that stuff, you know, we'll see. We'll see how I feel about those. I do like The Times Are, are a Change, and I think it's a very good song. So it's, it's one one out of 10 is, is good. So we'll see about the other nine. Well, I, I would I would hope you, it appears that you have two ears and a heart. So <laughs> it, it would make sense. The, the, the final thing that I'll leave us with, you know, and I kind of did this jokingly over the first two episodes, and I don't know how long I'm going to be continuing to do this. It'll depend on how good or bad uh, some of these album covers are, but I'm realizing so far that I do think there is a story being told. So, you know, this is the last album and this is the last one we took a, a look at. And for anyone who watched our first two episodes, you may have noticed that I've upgraded my camera set up here. Uh, so Shaboy is uh, one step closer to being professional. But yeah, so the, he's shed a little bit of the hillbilly look on this one. But, you know, now you've got that, that greater city landscape in the back. You know, he's talking about a lot more things. It's all coming from him. You know, it's more personal songs he's written. Of course, it's more personal. Look, he's got a girlfriend. I mean, come on. <laughs> so, you know, there's there's a little bit of, of playfulness here, even. Now, this is the album we're going to. We're, we're a little more seriousness. And we are a far away from here. So... You know, that, and again, that's, I think, more so what I mean by what he achieved with the times they are changing is what he set out to do. And I think you see that with the cover. I mean, this is, this is no nonsense. There's a little bit of nonsense on freewheeling. I don't think there's any nonsense on the times they are changing. I'm not saying that as a good or a bad thing, um, just his overall approach. Okay. Well, that's another thing to keep in mind. Dylan, man, he's the total package when it comes to like thinking things out. I, I had a note in here. I forgot to, to talk about it for whatever song I forget it was, but just every choice that he makes seems really well thought out. He It doesn't seem like he's leaving anything to chance from the production to the album covers. Well, maybe the first one, notwithstanding. Um, but I mean, just like the image of Bob Dylan seems like he's in total control of um, so that's that's another you know a cool thing it doesn't you know it doesn't matter to the music but I think it matters when you're talking about Bob Dylan and his legend and you know his his growth and uh, everything so all right based on based just on the album covers it looks like we're heading into some serious territory so that will be interesting I will get to that this week I'm going to listen to the times they are a change in uh, which we will discuss on the next episode. We discussed the freewheeling Bob Dylan on this episode. And uh, I think we had a, a, a very solid, productive discussion on it. I didn't change my, my tune on it too much, but uh, I think I gained a little bit more respect even for his songwriting acumen. And that's always good. Long episode. I already talked about how Dylan writes too long. And now here we are talking about Dylan too long. And any last thoughts? I think probably we've said everything we need to say. I think we've, we've written the book on Bob Dylan, I think, here. So I'll write. <laughs> that's it. Dylan's closed. We don't need to talk about him ever again. <laughs> no, uh, we will talk about him again next week. Uh, as always, thanks for watching. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Hit the bell for notifications. Uh, this, this is actually the toughest part of the whole episode for me because... Jason makes it seem so smooth when he's talking about all the things you got to do, the Facebooks and the Twitters and the, the Instagrams and, you know, check the description for all of these links and it doesn't matter. Uh, See, by this point, the background music would already be starting. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Damn it. Uh, by episode 30, I hope to have this locked down any, anyway. Um, thanks again for watching from all of us here. Tastes like music and, mostly just me and Dylan. Uh, we'll see you next time.